Hello everyone, my name is Jairaj and welcome to another amazing series from JR Academy. And uh, this series on uh, REST API is going to be really very important as well as uh, very in interesting in terms of information that we're going to discuss here. And uh, there won't be any serious coding in here, but uh, we will see some examples for sure. And uh, I am really very excited about this series because when I was creating Spring Boot series, at some point in time I had to stop because... Uh, my experience of learning web development says we need to learn about REST to go deep in the web development. So I thought let's create a series on REST along with the Spring Boot series. And another reason for this series is when I search internet for the REST details, uh, there are many good uh, video series on programming and web frameworks, but I haven't found any good series on uh, REST uh, information, especially REST rule books uh, such as how to design URL and how to design a header and stuff. So this series will help you to understand small things but very important things. And uh, before starting this video, I want to say thanks to the viewer because this would have never happened without your support guys. So thank you very much again. And if you are new here and want to learn various technologies such as Spring Boot, Mongo, REST and etc. Subscribe and share because our goal here is to provide information to as much people as possible. So let's jump into this tutorial. So this tutorial is the first tutorial on this series, a history of web and arrival of REST. So why history of web here? Uh, the series on REST then why we need to discuss the history of uh, web, right? But the thing is REST API is a very famous word nowadays and uh, most people think that uh, they know about REST since they are already working on it. But very few people actually know about the REST. So to understand the bigger picture of the rest, we need to understand a little bit about the web and the history of www or World Wide Web. So every time we see this word www, one thing comes into our mind, the internet. But it is really an internet. The web and internet is both the same thing. So clear answer is no. www and internet is two different things. So for example, consider a World Wide Web as a software running on the hardware named internet. So, but how this thing came into the picture since you see around you almost everything is online from your mobile to our glasses and our car to our home everything is online so if you go back 30 years in time this www was born in around 1985 this global internet started to take shape and a system like dns domain name service was built and in 1988 the first direct ip connection between europe and north america was made and a guy named Tim Berners-Lee was uh, working at the CERN. So CERN or C-E-R-N is a European organization for nuclear research. And uh, this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, was working at the CERN and he started talking about this web-like system. So imagine you are working at the research center with many computers without any central system and you want to find some file. And for to find that file, you need to look into each and every computers and search for that file. So and uh, he was frustrated about this inefficiency of finding the information and this information was in different computers, different locations and stuff like that. So on March 12th, 1989, he sent a proposal to CERN management and uh, this proposal was for system called MASH. So this MASH was basically an information management system which was based on the links embedded with the tags. It is it is something like our web page. If you go, if we go in our web page, we can see so many links on the text. You click on the text and you can directly jump into that web page. Or we have in some documents, you click on the title and you can directly jump into that uh, context of that title, right? So at that time, he used this word hypertext. Originally, this hypertext word was introduced in 1950, and he used this word because it was linking text with another reference document. But this proposal didn't move forward because of the fact that sometimes this document can have reference to images, videos or sometimes speeches or audio files. So Tim Berners-Lee keep digging into it and he moved from hypertext to hypermedia and uh, with the help of his colleague on 12th November 1990 he published another proposal to build a project called World Wide Web. So after almost a year of work, team and uh, his team had invented and implemented few things such as URI. So this URI is a uniform resource identifier. It is a tax or a syntax assigned to each and every web document. Uh, it is kind of a unique address or a path to that document. 
another one is html hypertext markup language so web resources can be in any form like video text or audio or anything but if you see web pages web pages are mainly text and to represent document with links or path he created this language that can do this and the third one is http hypertext transfer protocol a message based language or a protocol that defines how messages are transformed or formatted and a computer can use this communication over the internet and another thing he invented was web server and web browser so because of the main purpose of this web was to read the documents we needed a client server architecture and the application that can do that so he invented this browser and he named it with a world wide web and later they changed this name to nexus because it was confusing with this entire project but uh, they, it was the first browser that they created and another thing in this list was html editor and uh, this html editor was inbuilt with browser and it is like our developer tools in the browser so after this almost a year on august 6 1991 tim wrote this line on a first web page of world wide web so if you see even today we are using all of this so meaning team and his team's contribution in the world is very important and without this it is difficult to imagine the internet so after this in 1991 this browser came out of the sun and uh, we know about the browser wars and different kind of applications started coming out and this ball started rolling so this was the first generation of web or www and there are three generations of web till now web 1.0 it was very basic read only web because the initial goal of web was to search information and read that information and there was very few limited functionality for example in today's world we can we can consider craigslist as a web 1.0 and uh, web 2.0 this is a little bit advanced and provides read and write both kind of functionality so most of the big application right now such as youtube uh, blogging website or social media website is our uh, web 2.0 and web 3.0 which is the smart web it's the latest one and uh, the meaning it can generate the data which is not there so for example if we see the suggestion box in amazon which will show you the products based on our previous searches right so that data wasn't there and uh, this amazon is creating that data based on our previous history and uh, additionally we can put ai and uh, internet of things in the web category so this is how web evolved in last 30 years but if you see here we didn't discuss rest at all so reason here is that in last 3 minutes we have discussed 30 years but in reality a product needs multiple iterations before it reaches to perfection so same thing happened with web this evolution wasn't that simple it has long list of inventions of uh, various technologies and uh, every time we open history of web we have so many names that contributed to this web among them two names are very important so first one is uh, tim berners lee we have already discussed about him and another one is roy fielding so after first web page this internet thing grew too fast in next 5 years the number of web users reached to 40 millions and uh, every time something goes too fast it start collapsing and same thing happened with internet because of the infrastructure so internet infrastructure at that time wasn't just enough for that kind of load for example there was no stabilizing mechanism in web protocols um stuff like cache support so roy fielding a co-founder of apache http project started analyzing this problem and upon analyzing fielding group this key constraints of the web into six different categories and to solve this scaling problem of the internet we need an approach that can address this all six categories of this constraints so this constraint was a client server uniform interface layered system cache statelessness and code on demand so let's discuss everything a little bit so first one is client server architecture so server is a machine or a component that is a service provider and it provides uninterrupted service to the client as per the request and the client is the machine or a component that requests for service and receive the service and this client server architecture in other words is a separation of concern that means client and server may be implemented and deployed independently using any language or any technology so for example both of these could be different such as it could be linux or windows or mac but while sending and receiving the request there should be well defined communication protocol common format of request and response and error handling mechanism over there so both party can communicate with each other
and additionally there is no limit specified for number of clients per single server it is solely depends on uh, capacity of the server second one we have is uniform interface so interaction or communication between these components like client server and any other network related uh, machines should follow uniformity of interface while communication so meaning of this is all network machines including client servers and intermediate components should have common vocabulary for example http methods so this kind of uniformity can bring decoupling of service from architecture without any overhead and additionally this uh, category was divided into four different guiding principles and it was identification of resource manipulation of resource self descriptive message and hypermedia as the engine of uh, application state or hate os so we will discuss all of these four in detail in upcoming videos so moving ahead next we have is a layered system so this layered system is very important in any kind of system and basically in this context layered system means in the client server communication between client and server there will be many layers of network components such as it could be proxies it could be gateways or much more and we use this kind of components in between for security for caching and for load balancing right so these intermediaries will be transparent to uniform interface so all layered components uh, follow few things such as all components will support standard protocol for communication or in other words uh, predefined interfaces and they will only communicate to layer above them and layer below them and this layer can be add remove or modified as per our need and uh, we can rearrange this architecture for scaling so this middle components are very important but this layered system brings additional latency in the system which is a drawback but it also brings a benefit of uh, encapsulation of services and uh, limitation of uh, complexity and uh, improvement of the scalability so that's why this layered uh, system is very important so next one is a cache and um, it is the ability to store a frequently accessed data so this is one of the most important constraint in this discussion because this helps to reduce load on the server and it also helps to reduce the server latency because there is no need to prepare data again and again and cache can exist in any layer between client and server it could be at the client side it could be at the server side or it could exist in the middle such as content delivery network or a proxy or anywhere and with cache client receive responses from cache if the data is available in cache so requests don't reach at the server and it eliminates the unnecessary interaction between server and client and there are many caching strategies such as browser cache which is a client side cache and we have proxy cache or a gateway cache so next one is a statelessness so state means application's current state or a client's current state so to understand take an example of watching video on youtube so you are watching video you close the tab you reopen the same tag and that video resumes right so previously this uh, information of the state was stored at the server side meaning server used to keep track of each and every client state so uh, that means when demand increases this thing started to fall so this constraint statelessness meaning is uh, server should not store any application state related information and at the time of the requesting the information client need to pass all necessary information with the request so for example imagine we have table of employee records but we have pagination in ui and we can see only 10 records at time and you want to see next 10 from 11 to 20 so in this case with url we need to pass information about this details something like this and server won't keep track of all this so basically server ask clients to manage this complexity in order to serve more clients in other words there is no session stickiness at the server side and this played a huge role in scalability of the web next we have is a code on demand so this is the technology that enables server to send a software code to the client to be executed on client machine and uh, java applets java scripts and action script and video on demand sites are good example of this code on demand and this constraint is not mandatory in web architecture because of the fact that clients need to understand the code that is downloaded from the server so these are the six constraint of the web architecture that fielding laid out and after this fielding started working with team berners lee and they standardized this design and wrote a specification for new version of http and after this the adoption of these uh, standards happened globally very quick and the scalability problem of the internet just fade away 
After this, in year 2000, Roy Fielding named and described this architectural style in his PhD dissertation and the name was REST, Representational State Transfer, which is the architectural style contain above constraint and REST API is the APIs developed with this constraint. And this is how REST arrived to this world and uh, REST have a huge impact on internet and in this course we will learn how to design proper REST APIs with various examples and for that we have divided this course into three different categories such as general discussion, design discussion and uh, REST design patterns. So that's all for now in this tutorial and in upcoming videos we will take deeper dive into REST. So tell me what you guys think about this series in comment and if you have any questions you can also put in the comment and see you guys in next tutorial till then like share and subscribe keep learning thank you very much.